morning, my friends from around the world. It may be morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are listening to this. I am Coach Lucy Morris from, from the FlyingArcher.com, which is sponsored by New England School of Archery and Supplies. We have an amazing guest for you today, Crystal Gavin. Hey, Crystal. Hi. Hey. Crystal is an elite level archer from Connecticut. She has been shooting since December of 2012. Crystal also enjoys participating in mountain biking, cyclocross. <laughs> I didn't pronounce that right, but it's wicked cool. She was describing to me what that's all about. Swimming and running races. After less than a year of archery experience, Crystal decided to leave her job in the corporate world as a senior economic economist to pursue archery full-time as a profession. Crystal grew up in Ohio and considers herself a Midwesterner. Crystal is a three-time World Cup champion, two-time indoor World Cup finals silver medalist, two-time national championship silver medalist, and indoor world championship silver medalist. We have a lot to discuss, and please welcome from Bayville, Connecticut, Crystal. Hey, Crystal. How's it going? Hey, it's going great. Crystal, I just gave a brief overview on bio. So, Crystal, sit back, relax, take a minute or two, and tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into archery. Well, it really all started uh, with a bet in my husband in the backyard. He had an old hunting bow, had been in the basement uh, for 10 years or something, and I didn't even know how to pull back a bow. And I had a lot of upper body strength from being a swimmer, so I initially was very frustrated that I couldn't pull back this, you know, 35, 40 pound bow because mm -hmm. I knew I'm a strong and the bow was telling me I wasn't strong because I couldn't pull it back. And uh, once I got the hang of it and was able to draw it back, I proceeded to kick his butt and he kept <laughs> saying, best out of three, best out of five. And I just kept winning every end. Um, just, we had a, a little tiny block target and it was probably 10, 15 yards away. So not even that far away, but um, we then proceeded to go uh, to the closest range to us, which is Hall Zero in Manchester, Connecticut, which is the home of two different Olympians, one being Butch mm -hmm. Johnson, and that's who actually, not knowing who he was or anything about him, he was the one who helped us get set up with a lane and asked you know, asked us some questions, and I ended up buying a recurve bow Shot that for a little while, hated it, and kept begging to shoot a compound. And here in New England, compound is, I don't want to say frowned upon, but it's definitely not the, the bow of choice. And yeah. so I kept being told no, no, no. And finally, it wasn't until I made a, a deal, with, deal with the shop and my husband that I would enter... Uh, Hull's Arrow has these warm-ups every, the first Sunday all through the winter, um, first Sunday of the month, and they said if I took that 10-year-old hunting bow and I won the women's division with it, now, granted, I didn't have any stable stabilizers, it was a, I think there was some kind of hunting site on it, I'm not really sure, um, wrist strap release, but if I could win the women's division with that, they would let me buy a compound bow, and went and ended up winning by 100 points or something like that. So needless to say, they they let me get a compound, and that's what I got for Christmas that year and um, kind of took off from there. So you'd say you have a little competitive streak, huh? Yeah, I'm pretty competitive. Uh, it, it sometimes becomes a problem. I'm not allowed to play games with my family anymore. <laughs> So you'd say the compound is is your favorite bow to shoot? Um, yeah, I'll say it's my favorite. I mean, I I liked the recurve. It wasn't that I didn't like it. It was that I didn't like that I couldn't control where it was going. I, the problem I had with recurve was I could never get a consistent anchor point. Um, mm -hmm. and so I was constantly trying to move my sight or chase arrows, and it just it was more frustrating to me than calming, which. At the time, uh, with my old job, I needed a calming environment. Any more stress uh, would have put me over the edge. So, <laughs> so what um, was your favorite gadget that you like on your bow? 
I would say um, the Doinker A bombs, and not, I'm I don't know if a lot of people really know what they are, but it's it's basically an additional dampening system. It looks uh, like a little bomb, you could say, um, and they just screw on your stabilizers. You could put them on the end of the stabilizers. You could mix and match them with the weights and. I love them because the Doinker, I use them actually with the Doinker built-in system. A lot of people swap out and take off the Doinker um, the Doinker system that comes on and swap these out instead. And I like to use the combination of both um, just for added. It takes out a little bit more of the vibration. I, I found personally, I know a lot of people like to feel the vibration and kind of know we'll get feedback from their shop. But for me, I end up getting elbow pain or shoulder pain if I have too much vibration. And um, so adding the A-bombs really, I noticed a big difference with those. And also the cool thing for me, I like my front stabilizer to be a certain height when I'm knocking my arrow. Um, just feels more comfortable. And I've always struggled with having a lot of front weight on my bow. And the A-bombs mm -hmm. for the weight, they're much taller than the amount of weight that they actually are if you compare it to an ounce weight, for example. So I'm able to get a little bit more height without adding much weight to the front of my bow. So it's kind of a double purpose for me. Mm -hmm. You you said um, your initial instructor was Butch Johnson, and you didn't know he was an Olympian. Um, mm -hmm. What was it like to train under him as a beginner? Um, well, I'll say I don't really want to use the word instructor. It was more, he was the person at the range that set me up, showed me the basics of how to shoot, um, you know, where you put your fingers on the string, et cetera. So it was, it was very much a beginner 101 type setup lesson, you can call it. Um, the range does, I think it's like a half an hour. Anybody who buys a bow has to go through that, but, um, it it was very, <clears throat> I'd say it was pretty cool looking back because he never once tried to tell us who he was or um, act like he was better than someone. And it was, it's really cool to see because, you know, there's a lot of top shooters out there that will gladly tell you who they are any chance you give them. And so to see someone <laughs> yeah. um, at such a, you know, a five-time Olympian, not just a, you know, you go to one Olympics, that's great, but he's been to five. So um, someone who's really accomplished and he can still sit back and just enjoy the sport and, and help people. That, that's wonderful. That, that's what it should be like. Mm -hmm. um, so where have you traveled for competition as an archer? I've been all over the world. Um, I think... When I was counting up last year, um, I think, as I just pu published a uh, blog post about this, but I think it was something like 11 countries I had been to and maybe 19 states or something. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but just last year, um, for example, I went to Morocco. I went to Bangkok in Thailand. I went to Nimes in France. Obviously, a lot of states in the U.S. I went to Mexico. I went both to Guadalajara and Mexico City. In China, I went to Shanghai. In Turkey, Antalya. Um, in Poland, Roslov. I probably butchered that, but I'm trying. Uh, <laughs> Colombia, Medellin, and Italy. I cannot remember for the life of me the town, but it, oh, Rimini. Um, mm -hmm. right along the water, but it was in the winter, so not the time you want to go to a beach town in Italy. And <laughs> then, no. Is the water and frozen? Then, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, pretty, it was close enough to being frozen. Um, and then Copenhagen in Denmark for World Championships. Which one of those really stands out to you? I think it's hard for me because we don't get a lot of time off the field, especially for me trying to work a job as I travel. I have even less time when other people may be out exploring. I kind of have to stay back and get work done. So one country to another 
basically we're comparing archery fields, I would say, more so than the country. Um, I'll say the food in Italy, I absolutely loved. Um, that couldn't be beat. And Mexico, I'd say the people there uh, were probably the best of anywhere I traveled. Um, but in terms of the archery field and environment stuff, I actually, a lot of people didn't like it, but I loved uh, Copenhagen because a lot of our outdoor tournaments we shoot are really hot, they're humid, and for me, that's not my ideal temperature at all. My body just doesn't do well with heat and humidity, and so Copenhagen was actually colder than usual for that time of year, and so we had days where I could actually wear pants. Um, it was pretty crazy. You had you saw a lot of women wearing three, four layers um, trying to stay warm enough, but for me, it was actually ideal conditions. Um, so I'd say that was probably probably my favorite, and I ended up getting second, so um, that wasn't bad either. Oh, nice. <laughs> Um, which, which tournament was it that you placed second? Uh, that that one specifically was World Championships. Okay, but I had a lot of a lot of seconds this year. So you're you said that you you generally are still working while you're um, out competing and stuff. So you you have a job and you are traveling and competing. Yes. So that's cool. You're, you're showing the world that it can be done. <laughs> well, <laughs> it can and it can't. It, it, it all comes down to um, I, I've had, I kind of had a realization partway through this year because I, I was really getting frustrated because I didn't feel like I was doing as well as I wanted to do. And I really had to look at, um, because two years ago, so I quit my job for one, I had no job, just did archery for one year, and I was able to train as much as I wanted, and that wasn't just shooting arrows, that was uh, cross-training, being physically, at, you know, doing things for my body to stay healthier as well, and this year I really struggled between the travel and not being as physically active and not shooting as many arrows, and it was just all compounded that I really was getting frustrated at times, and I really had to step back and say, um, you know, I've decided that I need to work a job. I I can't sacrifice my family's well-being to not work a job. Um, as a female mm -hmm. archer, I'm just not – I'm not making money at archery, Um so with the with the cost of travel and so I need to work a job and so by working a job I've I've said that is a priority to keep to keep my job as a priority whereas someone else may say archery is the priority and working is on you know put on hold or whatever and so I have to be realistic about what that means I can't train as much as I want I can't do some of the things and in turn that means maybe I'm not going to win as many tournaments as you know, I want to initially. So I can do it. I'm going to do the best that I can, but I have to be realistic about um, that I'm not willing to sacrifice give, giving up giving up work to be the best in the world, which was, as a competitive person, was a very hard realization to come to. But it, but it is about priorities and what you value is more important. And And for me, being able to have a house and and that is more important at the end of the day than being number one in the world. So how how do you keep everything um, going? Uh, how do you keep your work life, um, archery life, family life um, balanced? <laughs> well, I didn't do a very good job of it this year. Um, I, <laughs> I, I definitely did not see – I saw my husband very little in certain – I think in January last year I was home a total of four days. Um, and most of – I think I think all of the trips in January last year he wasn't with me. So I had I saw him literally four days all, all month. And there was other times in the year where it felt the same way. We were going from World Cup to World Cup and home a couple days. But um, – Ultimately, for me, the biggest thing is between work and archery is just lots of to-do lists and 
calendars and schedules that I have to really keep on and follow. And um, I, I get to the point where I don't know what day it is. I don't know what to do. And, and literally my planner becomes my life that I have to rely on it to tell me where I need to go at what time because I, I can't keep it all straight in my head anymore. Um, but I am working on, on the, on the personal side balance, um, trying to be more strategic in the, in the tournaments I choose this year. Like, um, in past year, last year, you know, I, I tried to go to pretty much every tournament that I could. And this year I'm trying to be more selective and saying, okay, does this really add value to my goals? Um, whether that's, that's financially really or from an archery standpoint. Mm -hmm. So how, how did you, um, it's cause I know there's a lot of competitive people out there who really want to be like number one in, archery or the field that they're in or or anything how how do you and uh, let's say come to terms but how did you decide you know i don't need to be number one in the world in compound shooting or as an archer and to make that feel okay with yourself um <laughs> good question <laughs> i i'm i think i'm still working on on a hundred percent coming to terms with it. But, um, like I said, I just came down to anytime you have a goal, you realize you have to sacrifice things. And it came down to what was I willing to sacrifice to become number one. And mm -hmm. once I reached the point of being able to say, am I willing to sacrifice this or this or this? And when I said no, then I, then I realized, okay, well then I'm not willing to give up what I would need to give up to go for that because I know for me personally, now some people may be able to work a job and do a bunch of other stuff and be number one. Um, but I just realized from, I, I can't see how someone like that would be sane, but that's my, my, thought, yeah, <laughs> well, that's, that's kind of <laughs> how I felt. And, um, so I just, I just said, you know, I will, I'm still going to try. I still want to win, win things and, and obviously I'm still going to shoot for that number one as long as um, I can get funding to go to World Cups and things. But um, at the end of the day, I, I just – I'm not willing to give up what I would need to give up in order to go for that. And it is what it is. It, it's a it's a tough thing to do. But And I, I wish it wasn't the case. I wish I could get, you know, paid enough that I could work less or not work at all. But it's not the reality and – I'm also a realist, so um, I don't, you know, dream and hope and expect things to come my way. I I realize that you have to work for it, and and the reality in women's archery right now is just that that's the case. Hmm. That's interesting. I'd never thought of about that in women's archery. Is it different than in men's archery? I think there are quite a few men who can who can make a living and support a family even um, without having another job. I know quite a few men who do that, and archery is what they do. Whereas on the women's side, um, you know, I was number one this year in the U.S. working a job. Jamie Vanetta was number two in the U.S. She works a full-time job. Um, Paige Pierce was number three. She was a student part-time and then switched over working a job. So you have the top three women in the U.S. not being able to support themselves. They all are working jobs as well. So um, I think it's a very different, whereas on the men's side you have Rio and Brayden, and I don't know exactly what their order was or anything like that, but two of the, I think both of them were in the, they were one and two, I don't know, like I said, order, but both mm -hmm. of them are just doing archery, Rio supporting a family. Um, and granted, I don't want to take anything away from them. They both have been doing it much longer than I have. Um, but I use Jamie as a comparison on the female side because she's been around, I think, just as long, if not longer than than the men, so. So overall, it's probably percentage-wise, more men are able to do it without working, and um, 
the women are more typically having to juggle a, a full-time job or part-time job or something to keep them going while they're competing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you just look at payouts and contingency, and you can see they could win one tournament, and it it pays more than what my job pays, just that one tournament, um, my full-time job. Um, whereas in comparison, there, I don't think there's any women's tournaments that any tournament as a female I could win that would even everything combined pay, you know, what my salary is for the year. So. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, that's interesting. Um, so there's more payout to the men's division than there is to the women's division. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, hmm. Well, I want to talk about weather because weather seems to impact us everywhere. You know, <laughs> it's cold where you are and where I'm at, but what is the craziest weather day you have ever shot in? Well, I shoot every day at my house. is pretty windy <laughs> for the most um I live on top of a hill, so it's very rare if I get a calm day. So I've shot in some pretty crazy wind um, that a lot of people probably have never shot in. Um but in terms of a tournament, I would say World Championships was probably the craziest just because um, there was so much variance. We could, in the mornings, it would be, um, you could have pouring rain, freezing, almost like a freezing rain. It was really cold. And then later in the day, the sun would start to come out and the winds would die down. And then five minutes later, you would have a hailstorm. So... Um, oh, wow. it, really, <laughs> it really had kind of a little bit of everything at all times. Mm -hmm. It was definitely a, a test in having layers and various, you know, rain gear to um, summer gear. And then in the finals, what was funny was, so qualification on all the elimination rounds were all this very crazy wild wind or weather. And we get to the finals day and the sun opens up. It was probably in the 70s. It was just a beautiful day, no wind, and it. I was actually kind of disappointed in that, but um, yeah, it was it was crazy just to see how different the weather could be just on hour to hour. Oh wow! And yeah, that's when you really test in your rain gear. What <laughs> do you believe in having really good rain gear? Um, I I don't know in terms of really good, but I think you need to have something you can shoot in um, and and practice to make sure you can shoot in it. Because I've seen lots of people show up with stuff that it may be expensive or high quality, and then they get to a tournament and they go to shoot in it and it contacts the string or they can't move the way they need to move or whatever. And so I think the most important thing is getting stuff that fits in a way that you can shoot properly in it. And sometimes it may mean you need to put an arm sleeve or an arm guard or something over top of it that you normally wouldn't wear or whatever, but mm -hmm. figuring that out in advance is, is pretty crucial. Oh, yeah. That'd be the worst thing to go to um, a major tournament and find out that you can't pull the string back without... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So what what country books have you read? Um, I, I honestly don't remember the name of most of them. I when I first was kind of making my initial push to go from not making the shoot off at Lancaster to um, trying to make the USAT team that that first year, I between me and my husband, I think he got me or I found books to borrow from people pretty much most of the archery books published in the last 15 years or something like that. Um, and I can honestly say um, none of them were really what I was looking for. They all kind of had things they were better at than others, but um, none of them really gave me that, okay, this is the final push. This is what I need to take me from this level to this level. And, um, those were archery-specific books. Now, I did read um, with Winning in Mind, which actually was recommended um, 
by someone at Halls. And it's kind of funny because my husband was an all-American rifle shooter in college, and he had read that book a long time ago. And I actually now, anyone I coach, it's required reading. Um, I really think it's a good foundation. I've read other mental books, but that's the one I come back to, and I think it applies to the most people in terms of ease of reading and what you take out of it. I've read some that you may take more out of them, but they're very hard to get through, and some are easier to read, but you just don't pick up as much from them. So I think it's kind of the best of both worlds. And so that's really good. And then shout out to my friend Nikki Haverstock, who has come out with a fictional uh, series. Uh, I think they're called the Target Practice Mysteries. And they're just short stories, um, I guess is what they're technically classified as. But they're awesome. I've always been an avid reader. And Mm -hmm. Obviously, I got to love them because they're about archery, but they really are, even if I wasn't an archer, I think they're great, just fun, uh, quick reads, and um, she's doing a really great job with those. So that has to Did be you know the probably names the of those? Um, they They're like death at, the, death at the Range, Death at the Trade Show. I, <laughs> I I'm probably butchering them, but it's along. But I, like I said, I think it's the Target Practice Mystery series is is kind of the mm-hmm. overarching. But they're on Amazon. You can get them for Kindle or whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I highly recommend those to anyone who likes just fun, easy reading. Well, hey, there you go, listeners. I just took half a page of notes. And I'll have those notes at theflyingarcher.com on our show notes page. And you can follow Crystal on her Facebook page, her Twitter, and her Instagram, YouTube, and email. And I'll have all those on on the show notes on the face on my website, theflyingarcher.com. And so you don't have to. Uh, let go of the steering wheel while you're driving, so no worries there. Um, what strategies do you have if your equipment breaks in a competition? So for me, it's it's pretty simple. First, I would raise my hand, flag a judge, something right away to make sure, um, as long as it's not in a head-to-head, um, because then you can't do that. But um, mm-hmm. I would get the judge's attention, and then I would – quickly try to assess what the problem is and then just begin working on fixing it. Um, this, I think it's really important. This is, I think, something especially women more so than the men um, tend to rely on other people for doing their equipment setup. And I think it's really important to know your own equipment. And then, so first step is knowing your equipment and knowing, being able to know what's wrong. But then the second thing is being able to fix it. What I tell some of my students, um, you know, they may be younger and they may not be able to do everything yet, but trying to get them to learn certain things because I explain to them what happens if you're in in China and mom or dad's not there to help you. What are you going to do? Because that's they always say, well, mom will fix it or dad will fix it. And um, so I try to get across to them, your goal is to make these international teams or, um, you know, travel to these big tournaments, well, what are you going to do when somebody's there, not there to help you? So and that's something I remember Christy Collin saying at a a seminar I went to my first year at Lancaster, um, and I just, I listened to what she said and, and really took that home and um, have have used that mindset ever since that at the end of the day, I may not do everything myself because my husband loves working on equipment, but... Um, I know how to, and I can yep. do can do it when I need to. And that's very empowering because you're you're teaching um, your arty clients how to think of themselves and then the checklist of what to do when something happens. Mm-hmm. So it's not just looking over your shoulder looking for coach, mom, dad, help. Yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> May still be doing that, but still go have the confidence. You know what? I got it. I can fix this. And, um, geez, do you ever have issues of other people wanting to toy with your boat when you're at a competition? 
Um, I, I have seen and experienced some of that. Um, the, the biggest advice I can give people is uh, just keep an eye on your equipment. Know who you can have kind of a buddy system with someone that you can trust each other that if one of you needs to run to the bathroom or whatever. Um, I think it's especially important on the international scene when you may have people from a lot of different countries and um, and just culturally things are different. And so what you may see as okay versus what somebody else sees as okay um, might be slightly different blurred lines there. So it's always good just to have have eyes on your equipment. Hmm. You know, it might be, I don't know if you do this, but it might be a good idea to talk with uh, international um, students about cultural differences. Um, yeah, I've actually made a lot of friends um, that are archers on in various different countries. Um, and one thing I will say is, as Initially, I I don't want to say I offended people, but there was little things that I had no idea. For example, here in the U.S., um, a very common thing is it's common courtesy to stay on the line if the person next to you is still shooting. If you're done shooting, you don't walk right off the line immediately. Well, the first World Cup I went to, um, it was an indoor World Cup, and the girl shooting next to me was a left-handed staring right at me. So <laughs> I even more so was very cautious of, I'm I'm a pretty quick shooter. I'm usually one of the first people off the line, and so I was very cautious, especially, you know, she'd be at full draw. I wasn't going to move. I stood very still, you know, waited for her to shoot the shot, and then I would come off the line. Well, I actually had – she didn't speak great English, and I had another competitor come over to me and actually tell me that they were going to report the judge on me if I continued to do that. And I said, you know – do what? <laughs> I'm just letting her shoot her shot. Well, internationally, it's actually rude to stay on the line. Um, you're supposed to leave the line immediately. That girl actually felt like pressure with me standing there. She felt like I was like watching her shoot, you know, shoot the shot. And it's a very different, like I said, I had no idea I wasn't intentionally doing that, but there's a lot of things like that that, um, it's always helpful to ask and learn, and and that's where it's great. Had that other girl not come up to me and explain the situation, it could have, you know, been a much worse situation, and that's why I go out of my way to be friendly with my competitors, talk to them, and on the flip side, the same thing could happen if, if one of them is doing something that may be offensive to an American. I'm happy to kind of explain the situation to them, um, because everybody wants to, you know, I want to keep everybody happy, and ultimately I want everyone competing at their best level, and no one should feel like something's hindering them just because of cultural, you know, problems, so. Oh, very true. And probably what helps with people um, when they're shooting is understanding their mental game. Like, how how do you stay in the moment when you're shooting and someone's doing something that just it is kind of getting to you, but might be... Um, anything, but you're you're on the line there. Um, what's your mental game? Um, I'm lucky enough that I don't notice many things when I'm shooting because I am so focused, and I think a lot of that goes back to I'm thinking of specific steps in my process or whatever it is that I'm saying or doing at that specific time. But um, I actually don't even notice a lot of things going on around me um, unless it would interfere with, you know, getting in my sight picture or somebody hitting me or something like that. Um, but for the most part, besides locally, whenever I shoot locally, I have – and people crack jokes. That's something I have trouble at full draw with, with not laughing. Um, but <laughs> But besides that, I think it comes down to just being focused and in the zone and – and really repeating your steps and knowing what it is you need to be focusing on. And then, like I said, you won't even notice what's going on around you. How, how do you teach this to your students? <laughs> I don't think there's an easy way to teach this. It's it's partly a maturity thing. I think there's definitely um, 
you have to have not necessarily a certain age, but a certain maturity to to get the concept in the first place. But then a lot of it's just trial and error. What works for me might not work for somebody else. And um, so having them try to find what does work for them. And for some people that's singing a song in their head or um, or literally walking through Knock My Arrow, you know, walking through the steps and saying each one in their head to themselves and, um, other people, it's more of kind of a Zen clearing their head of everything. And so I encourage them just to try, try different things, try thinking of different things. And I also, um, encourage, they don't always listen. We've had this conversation with a couple of people recently, but, um, is an archery journal and write down on the days you're shooting well, or the days you're not shooting well, write down what you were thinking about, what was going on and, try to isolate the good and the bad and what works and what doesn't work that way um, Mm -hmm. by keeping track of it. How how does the food you eat on the day of a shoot impact your thinking and your shooting ability? Um, So for me personally, I have um, what food I eat isn't, doesn't really impact me too much. I'm I'm pretty lucky and I have a pretty tough stomach, so traveling overseas oh, and envious. everything, <laughs> I can eat pretty much anything and I'm not going to get sick. And um, in terms of performance, I've tried kind of tracking whether, you know, carbs the night before or meat the night before and things like that, and I don't really notice a difference. Um, the biggest thing for me is I'm hypoglycemic, and so I have to eat every couple hours or I can pass out. And oh, wow. So for me, it's more eating on a regular schedule <laughs> and mm-hmm. making sure that I'm um, – tournaments can be long and making sure I always have food on hand. Um, if I do start to feel a little shaky, you know, knowing, okay, I need to eat something. And um, so for me, it's more the timing of that, which depend, which can get tricky because um, I try to time, you know, big meals versus small meals and things like that according to when we're going to shoot, and especially at some of the bigger or international things, you may not have control over what time the um, lunches or the breakfast is open and what time you're shooting, and things can change um, with the schedule. And so for me, that's why I've I've really learned I have to have significant amounts of food on hand with me at all times um, that – if I can't get a meal, I can, I have a protein shake that, you know, kind of could be a meal replacement if I need to. Um, I can get away with it without having serious problems. So do you generally have a cooler with you? And um, snacks in your pocket? Yeah, I usually, I carry my Easton backpack usually with me to all tournaments and I'll, sometimes I'll take a cooler more domestically, it's easier. Internationally, it's pretty much impossible. Most places don't even have ice um, at the hotels. So um, cold stuff is kind of difficult. But, yeah, um, I always have, like, beef jerky is another good food I always bring with me because I can always eat a piece of jerky between an end. Um, but it's dense enough that I'm getting some real food if I need it, things like apples or grapes. I like a lot of fruit. Um, I know a big thing, a lot of people bring like cliff bars and that kind of thing because, again, it's a denser, packs more more punch. Well, I mean, I find that the cliff bars to give me a sugar spike. um, Yeah, yeah. Some people, I am not personally a huge fan of cliff bars, but I know that's a big, um, like, Bridger Deaton is a diabetic, and so that's something he always has on hand that if his blood mm-hmm. sugar drops, it's actually a really good thing because it's got the sugar. He can take have that and a can of Coke and get right back in it. So. Whoa. <laughs> I'm just trying to see myself shoot after drinking a can of Coke. <laughs> <laughs> it would be very amusing. Um so, and that's that's where knowing knowing your body, it's important to know your body and what practice, try things in practice that you may have to in a tournament. Like I found I can drink a, 
an espresso and then go shoot. It doesn't affect me at all. Um, whereas, like you were saying, a, you know, a can of Coke would probably send you high wire. So um, everybody's body is different. And I, I'd say the biggest advice for people is, is knowing don't do anything different in a tournament that you've never tried in practice. Oh, that's very important. Do you have a pre-tournament ritual? Uh, no. I've, I think I've had various things, but in general I'm not, I try not to be superstitious or, or anything with, um, with getting ready for stuff because I, I think it just adds one, one more layer of something that can go wrong. Um, mm -hmm. and especially again with, I've, I've, I've always been someone who's very detailed, very scheduled. I like to okay, this is where I'm going to be, this is what I'm going to do, um, not just because of working in archery, but growing up, I did everything under the sun, and my life was very, you know, scheduled out. Okay, I have 15 minutes to study for this test before I have to go to practice, to, to go tutor, to, you know, whatever. And I've had to learn uh, the hard way that in archery, especially, again, on the international scene, Schedules are going to change. Things are out of your control. You may be waiting on a bus longer than you thought or or whatever. And so being flexible um, becomes very important. And so I think any time you can eliminate things that depend on timing or schedule or doing the same thing every time um, besides the actual shooting, um, the mm -hmm. better. And so... For me, you know, if I had a pre-ritual and say things changed and I wasn't able to do it, then that would mess me up. And so I just take take that right out of the equation. Oh, that sounds like a good idea. Um, what is the craziest thing that's happened to you while you were shooting? I can't think of anything that's super crazy that's happened to me. Um I mean, the only thing, it, it's nothing that happened to me, but we were shooting team trials um, in Chula Vista, and during the head-to-head -head matches, um, there was a bird that landed on the one girl's arrow. And so we're walking down to the bale, <laughs> and, and you know the it? rule, you can't touch an arrow until it's scored, and here's this bird just sitting on this arrow. <laughs> so it was kind of, kind of something different. How would you describe what it feels like to shoot an arrow? And this would be for somebody who was the first time they've uh, they've never shot before. Uh, I honestly would probably tell them it's something that it's that I can't describe it. It's something they need to feel and experience for themselves. Um, I think shooting an arrow can be many different things for many different people, and for some, and and it also depends on. I think kind of where you're at and what's going on in your life. For some people, it can be a very zen, calming, um, almost stress-relieving type of activity. And then for someone else, it can be a really intense, uh, very nerve-wracking, you know, high-pressure situation. So um, I would just encourage everyone to give it a try and see what it is for them. Do you still find... Um archery calming for you, you know, doing this high-level competitive? Um, yeah, I actually, sometimes I actually have the opposite problem that it can be too calming for me. Um, I've, I've definitely realized this year that I've struggled when I get in hi the higher pressure situations, I typically get more calm, and it's actually has kind of had a been detrimental um, because I lose that extra mental edge, I'll say. Um, huh. And so I personally am trying to find ways to kind of get a little bit of the nerves back, if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I found like there was times last year I would be at a local tournament, um, not even something with zero competition essentially and because I shoot in the men's division so there are times where I have some pretty good competition but I'd be at a tournament with essentially no competition and I would be shaking 
and nervous. And then World Cup Finals, you know, I'm up there just shooting and completely calm. So it's it's kind of a a weird and another example this year in Bangkok I had a brand new bow, first time shooting the bow in competition, hadn't had the bow very long, so was still getting used to it and the first two ends I could bear I felt like I could barely hold the sight on the target. I was so nervous and shaking, shot two thirties and then as I calmed down my scores got worse. So for me it's kind of finding that that balance of of having some nerves and and being able to stay zoned in without getting too calm. There, there is something about having that a little adrenaline rush, which isn't extremely high, but it's enough. It just kind of sort of like at a little bit higher than just being totally relaxed. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, and then when you don't have that, you're just kind of like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I get that. Um, that's the same with me. Well, you know, if I'm just, you know, going to go up and give a public speak, um, presentation and I'm too relaxed and I have no adrenaline, then it's just totally flat. But when you have a little bit of that, it's just, man, you can be right in the zone. Mm-hmm. Um, and same with competing. It makes it feel fun, too. Yeah. Yep. Um, wow. Crystal, the time has just flown by and you've been an incredible guest. And uh, I would like to give you the, the last word. Could you leave us with a pearl of wisdom or inspiration that you'd like to share with the world? Hmm. Um, hmm. I guess I would just say um, what I tell a lot of people is the day archery is not fun for you is the day you should quit. And I think that applies not just to archery but life in general. Um, you got to keep having fun and enjoying what you're doing or it, it's really not worth it. Oh, that's that's really wonderful advice because isn't life about living mm-hmm. and enjoying it? Well, Crystal, thank you for being on the show. And, thank um, you for having me. All of the, the links, websites, and resources from this podcast will be posted on the website and at theflyingarcher.com.